Part 1. You are going to listen to a conversation between two friends who are discussing the organization of a party. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, Matt. Right on time. Have you been waiting long? Mm, five minutes. The buses were held up on the high street. Otherwise, I would have been early. Yeah, there's something wrong with them today. Yes, I think so. OK, what should we do? Should we go and have a coffee? Yeah, that would be nice. There's that place on the corner over there. It does really nice coffee and cakes and things, and at this time it's usually very quiet, so we'll be able to talk. OK, let's go there then. So, when's the party going to be? Well, it has to be at the end of September, before we all leave for university. We've plenty of time then. We don't go for another five weeks, do we? Hmm, well, we haven't really got that much time, if you think about it. There are only a couple of weeks at the beginning of September when all of us are around. Oh, yes, I forgot. Nazrin, Phil and Nicky and all that lot have gone off on holiday. And I'm away for two weeks from tomorrow. So, what does that leave us, then? As far as I know, we're all here between the 19th and the 30th of September. Will Sandra be around, then? I know that she has a whole string of family birthdays at that time, and she might not be available. Hmm... Well, let's make a note of that, and we can contact her about it. OK. Shall we settle for the 21st of September, then? What day is the 21st? It's a Saturday. Is that OK? That's fine. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen to the second part of the conversation, answer questions 6 to 10. For these questions, there are three alternatives, A, B and C. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. And now for the tricky bit. Where are we going to hold it? Well, I spoke to Nikki last week, and she volunteered her place, as they have a huge house and garden. Oh, fantastic. Will her parents be around? Yeah, I think so, but she said they won't mind. Oh, right. Well, my parents wouldn't like it at all. <laughs> Nor mine. <laughs> but is it definite? Yes. When I spoke to her, she said it was definitely on. I'll just have to confirm the dates with her. We thought it would be one weekend in September, so I'll just have to make sure that that one is OK. One thing Nikki suggested, we could have a daytime party, as we could be outside if the weather is fine. Oh, wow. How far out does she live? It's not that far. Do you know where West Road crosses the bridge? Yeah. It's the first house on the right, with that huge drive up to the front door. Oh, right. I know exactly where it is. The road is off the A33 and runs north, then over the bridge and first on the right. I know it. Ah, oh, the place is amazing. You know it has a big swimming pool. Does everyone know where she lives? Most of her friends do, but not all. But it doesn't matter, as we can put this map Nicky sent me in with the invitation. How shall we do the invitation? We can do it on the computer. I can scan the map and we'll put it all onto an A4 page. Is this the address? Can I just write the address down? It's 93 West Road, 
and I'll take the phone number. It's 477130. Right. There's one other thing. Yes? We're all giving £10 towards refreshments and food. There'll probably be a barbecue. Do you think that's enough? Oh, right. Yeah, that's fine. And everyone will have to help tidy up afterwards, including the boys. <laughs> that is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear Laura talk about this year's International Food Festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everyone. Today we have a special guest speaker. Laura Lanthor is director of the International Food Festival this year. Laura, can you tell us about what to expect at the festival? Of course, Vincent. This spring, people in the city can go to the 7th Annual International Food Festival. This is a special event for the whole family. I do have to tell you, though, we are holding it at a different date than before. Easter is exceptionally early this year, and if the festival were held as usual, it would have fallen on the same weekend. This year, the festival will be held on the first week of April, before Easter. The festival will be held at the Walker Field grounds and will be divided into four main areas. There will be a Western food area with authentic representations of European cuisine. There will also be an East Asian section with chefs and products from Japan, Korea, and China. A South Asian section will have food from India, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. For the first time this year, we will also have a Latin American section where people can try things from Mexico, various Caribbean countries, and South America. There will also be special booths where people can learn about all these cuisines. This year, we are expanding the cooking workshop and demonstration portion of the festival. Attendees last year really seemed to like learning about food and having a hands-on experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. I'll give you a brief description of three of the workshops we have. Like I said, these allow you to participate directly in the making of food and teach you techniques you can use at home. For a full list of them, please go to our online website. We will give you the site address after the end of my talk. You will also find there the procedure to pre-register for the workshops. Pre-registration takes place when you buy your festival tickets and is highly recommended. Non-Western food has become increasingly popular these days and many people are interested in how to cook such food at home. Such cuisines use a variety of different spices, ones that aspiring cooks might not be familiar with. Therefore, our World Tour of Spices is a good introduction to the flavor profiles of other cuisines. I would recommend it for adults who want to seriously learn about cooking. Small children might not take to the more exotic spices. One workshop that is meant for children is Candy Adventures. 
There are traditional activities like making gingerbread houses. Other activities teach basic decorating techniques, including the proper use of coloring dye. Kids can also learn how to make flowers and other objects out of cake frosting. We understand the concerns of parents regarding their children's health, so everything used in this workshop is either sugar-free or uses acceptable sugar substitutes. Lastly, we have a workshop that is suitable for the whole family. Salads Forever is a workshop for everyone interested in healthy eating. There will be different kinds of salads that people can try and demonstrations that show how to make them. Salads have grown in popularity these days and are a healthy addition to any diet if prepared the right way. The workshop will also teach how to make healthy salad dressings. I'm afraid that's all I have today. Please visit the festival website for more details. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a university student and a faculty advisor about the requirements for the student teaching semester. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. I'd like to go over with you today some of the requirements for your student teaching, which you'll be undertaking next semester. I'm really looking forward to working in a real classroom and teaching children, but I'm nervous about it too. One of my roles is to provide you with whatever support you may require. One thing that helps me do that is to know what you're doing in the classroom, so I require all my students to keep a journal about their teaching experience. That sounds like a lot of work. Will I have to write in it every day? Yes, if you can. You'll give it to me at the end of each week. Another thing I want from you is a few sample lesson plans. I'll let you know ahead of time exactly how I want you to do them. Several of us from the university will be student teaching at the same school. Are we supposed to get together regularly to discuss our work? I'll meet with each student teacher individually. But you aren't required to meet with each other. Of course, you can talk together as much as you want. You will, however, have to observe some of the other teachers in the school, besides the teacher you'll be working with. Then will I get an evaluation from my supervising teacher at the end of the semester? Actually, no. I'll do your evaluation, and I'll base it on several things. One is your required portfolio, which you contain samples of your class activities and your students' work. Another important thing is your term paper. Then there won't be a final exam? No, we don't feel that's necessary for student teaching. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. I know I have to get an agreement form signed. Since you're my advisor, are you the one to do that? Uh, no, that form is for your supervising teacher to sign, to document that he or she agrees to have you in the classroom as a student teacher. Oh, I see. I'm concerned about the term paper I'll have to do and the evaluation process. I'm not sure I understand what I'm supposed to do. 
Regarding the term paper, the first thing is to choose a topic. It should be related to your teaching work. You should let me know your term paper topic by the end of the first week of the semester. Will you be observing me regularly in the classroom? Yes, and during the fourth week of the semester, we'll have our first evaluation meeting to discuss my observations. One thing I'm really looking forward to is the student-teacher conference that the university puts on every year. I'm glad you're looking forward to it. Of course, everyone in the program is required to attend. The conference takes place... let me check. Yes, the seventh week of the semester. When will I have to turn in my term paper? The term paper is due by the end of the 14th week of the semester. Then during the 15th and final week, we'll get together one last time for a semester review. Wow! It looks like I have a busy semester ahead of me. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a professor give a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good evening. I'm Professor Williams, and this class is Introduction to Anthropology. This class meets every Tuesday evening from 6.45 until 8.15. Please be on time for each class session. This evening we'll begin with a discussion of hunter-gatherer societies. This is an important topic because at one time all humans were hunter-gatherers. What are hunter-gatherer societies? They are groups of people that survive by hunting animals and gathering plants to eat. Typically in these societies, the men's job is to hunt large animals, while the women both gather plants and hunt smaller animals. Before 12,000 years ago, all humans lived as hunter-gatherers. Now there are relatively few groups of people living this way, but there are some. Experts estimate that in about 50 years or so, all such groups will have disappeared. Today, hunter-gatherer societies still exist in the Arctic, in some desert areas, and in tropical rainforests. These are areas where other forms of food production, namely agriculture, are too difficult because of the climate. In history, Many hunter-gatherer societies eventually developed into farming societies. What are some of the basic differences between hunter-gatherers and farmers? The first is that hunter-gatherers tend to be nomadic. They travel from place to place. Once they have used up the food in one area, they have to move on to the next place to find more. Farmers, on the other hand, are more likely to be sedentary. They can't move often because, of course, they have to stay in one place long enough to plant their crops and harvest them. Another difference is that hunter-gatherer societies generally have lower population densities. Farming can support much higher population densities than hunting and gathering can because farming results in a larger food supply. So you'll find smaller groups among hunter-gatherers. Another very important difference is in social structure. A characteristic of hunter-gatherer societies is that they tend not to have hierarchical social structures. They usually don't have surplus food or surplus anything. And if they did, they would have no place to keep it, since they move around so often. 
So, in a hunter-gatherer society, there is little ability to support full-time leaders. Everybody has to spend their time looking for food. These societies are more egalitarian than farming societies, where we see hierarchical social structures begin to develop. Please bear in mind that everything I've said so far this evening is of a general nature. Next, we will look at some specific examples of hunter-gatherer societies to see how these general concepts translate into reality. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.